Good morning, California, and good evening in China and Asia time. Uh, this is Yi Chui. I'm a faculty of material science engineering. On behalf of my uh, co-director of Storage X initiative at Stanford right here, um, uh, Professor William Chair, I would like to welcome you back to our Storage X symposium. Um, so this is a very exciting event we launched about half a year ago, try to bring together all the battery researchers to uh, discuss exciting topics. After 10 exciting events, um, and this event we are going to have an industry panel. The previous 10 exciting events, we were having academia to talk about cutting edge research topic. In this industry panel, we will have a exciting discussion about a very promising materials on silicon. But before I do that, I would like to acknowledge our industry sponsors for Storage X, our industry members um, over the past year, giving us a lot of support both Will and I and the whole team and Storage X right here. Uh, really like to thank the support from BASF, Chauwei, ExxonMobil, Morata, PGE, Samsung, Shell, Toyota, and Trafigura. Today, uh, I also like to announce Applied Materials joining Storage X to continue to support our effort uh, in the symposium and also broadly in the research areas. So with this initial introduction, now let me move on to the panel. And Will and I prepare a very exciting panel to the audience around the world. And they are the leaders in the areas of uh, silicon, NO, and proliferation. Uh, we have three speakers for this panel, uh, Dr. Kang San, uh, who is the CEO of uh, Amplius, certainly taking the uh, effort for the past decade to commercialize silicon nano. The second speaker we are having is Jim Cushion from Applied Materials. He's leading the effort of an apply to deposit lithium metal for multiple purposes, including proliferation, including as a thin lithium foil for lithium metal batteries. The third speaker is Suji Kuma, who has been leading a Zin lab to develop silicon graphite anode with a lot of promise right there as well. So with the three speakers, each one of them will give us a 20 minutes presentation. After their presentations, we'll have a 45 minutes panel discussion. Um, I will welcome the audience to uh, provide your questions through the Q&A session. Um, and both Will and I would like to moderate the Q&A session, the uh, panel session to really discuss, have a deep dive on the silicon. With that, I would like to have Dr. Kang San from Amplius to kick off today's uh, panel presentation. Kang, please. Okay, thanks, Yi. Uh, today, uh, my discussion here serves two purposes. And the first is to introduce you some uh, silicon anode development and the commercial products made at Amplius. Uh, the second purpose is to share some of our thoughts, how to effectively use a silicon anode uh, uh, in commercial products. So uh, the reason we are here is very obvious. Silicon displayed uh, very high energy density compared to the com conventional graphite anode we are currently using. However, silicon has its uh, own characteristics some of those properties are quite challenging, make silicon uh, difficult as an anode material for lithium ion battery. Back to early 1990s, uh, 
uh, engineers, scientists, especially in Japan, had a start exploring the possibility to use silicon as an animal material for lithium ion battery. But many of those attempts were not very successful. About 12 years ago, Professor Yi Chui at Stanford University proposed a concept that I think even today is the most ideal silicon anode structure, that is a silicon anode structure. So Ampere's was uh, <coughs> formed based on this concept from a Professor Yi Chui's lab. Today, Ampere's has two high energy density lithium ion, uh, lithium uh, uh, silicon anode technology platforms. We have one is a 100% active silicon nanowire anode materials. We also have a silicon graphite anode platform. So the, the both uh, demonstrate the highest capacity commercial anodes in industry today. I have to em emphasize the commercialized anode. So Ampere's has a, a commercialized the highest energy density silicon anode battery technologies. Now we have a, a battery technology from 320 watt per kilo for EV application to 400 watt per kilo for airspace uh, applications. Now we develop the high capacity silicon anode ecosystem. This is the part I like to emphasize in today's presentation. Okay, that including many parts uh, in the material, the, including silicon anode itself, matching cathode, electrolytes, periodization protocol, binders, formulations, manufacturing process. For silicon anode, we have to make our own equipment. Yeah, then the formation protocols, uh, cell designs, all those are very important part of the silicon anode system. Now, this ecosystem maximizes the silicon anode performance. And very recently, we demonstrated over 500 watt per kilo silicon nanowire anode batteries. And I would believe our roadmap today will lead to even higher uh, performance. Now, I like to share as much information and data as possible, but I only have 20 minutes. So I will go through this presentation uh, fairly quickly. Uh, if you have a question, you always can, uh, can contact me at Ampere's or contact the Professor Yi Chui at Stanford University. So this is our 100% active silicon uh, nanowire structure. This structure build, uh, first we have this uh, conductive filament is grown uh, from the substrate. Then we coat the silicon around the filament and produce the porous amorphous silicon structure. After that, we have a thin layer coated around the coating silicon, so reduce the surface area. So if you look at this from a cross section, they look like a double-sided carpet. Uh, but this silicon nanowire actually quite uh, strong. Okay, uh, we can we can press it. We can uh, do the winding, the stacking. Will not damage silicon nanowire. Yeah. So silicon nanowire uh, has uh, the uh, in, we made in our product has a micro and a macro uh, porosity. We think the silicon nanowire we have a micro porosity. Between the silicon nanowire, we have macro porosity. Yeah, because this is a unique structure, so it enables us okay, to uh, mitigate the silicon swell problem. Yeah, also, because the silicon nanowire structure is not, uh, doesn't like, uh, uh, it's very different from the uh, silicon particle structure, they don't interfere each other. So gave us very stable uh, anode. Now this is uh, uh, the typical uh, the discharge curve here. You can see our silicon nanowire anode capacity is very close to theoretical limit here. We can lift it to 34,000 milliamp hour per gram. The, the picture on the right hand side is demonstrated the advantage 
of a silicon nanowire structure compared to uh, the silicon graphite structure. Uh, this Rigonis uh, 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 plot uh, demonstrates how we modulate our silicon nanowire anode to achieve different uh, performance and uh, for different applications. You see this red line here, okay, is uh, for give high energy. The blue line, we can achieve high energy. Now we also have, we can achieve the balanced power and the energy. So this is very unique. Uh, recently we demonstrated a 510 watt per kilo and potentially, okay, based prediction here, we can achieve about 700 watt per kilo here. Yeah. Also, uh, uh, you look at this chart, you know, the silicon anode we uh, designed here is agnostic to the cathode. It doesn't matter we use uh, lithium oxide or we use uh, uh, NMC. Silicon and the graphite, they are similar, but they are different. For years, many people, uh, many companies try to sell silicon to the industry without a success. Yeah, the long process, uh, there are companies that have been selling silicon and for 12 years uh, without a success. Uh, the reason is very simple, okay, uh, because the industry, uh, most of the uh, battery manufacturers uh, think just simply replace, uh, replace carbon by silicon, then they can achieve better performance. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, I think those are two different type of materials. Just a like fresh water fish and the salt water fish, you cannot put them together. So city can require very different ecosystem. So at, at Ampris, we designed a city structure a long time ago. Yeah, but we spent years trying to find out what can the ecosystem make our city structure work. Yeah, that including many aspects, okay, from elect from uh, uh, electrochemistry to the cathode, yeah, to even to the equipment. Manufacturing process, prioritization process, yeah, formation protocols. Yeah. So, silicon and require different uh, ecosystem, also require different manufacturing process. So, this is a, a, a chart. Now, silicon require very different electrical uh, electrolyte. Yeah, electric, uh, electrochemical environment. So years ago, we couldn't figure out this. So uh, even we have a better silicon structure, the best silicon structure, ideas silicon structure, we couldn't make it work. In the last three years, I just designed a group of uh, we call silicon electrolytes. That enable us give superb performance. You look at it here, it is on the left hand side. Uh, we are able to perform at the minus 50 degree. This is a uh, product made for US uh, and NASA. Now, this one demonstrates the electrolytes, uh, impact of electrolytes. This white line, we use the regular electrolytes used in graphite product. Then blue line, is we designed for silicon. So we, at Ampere's, we call silicon and electrolytes. That enable improve the cycle performance and the low uh, swelling rate. So uh, silicon structure is extremely important. Uh, this is a, a silicon nanowire anode, which is made a very minor change of our silicon network structure without them. Can let, let me interrupt a little bit. Um, uh, looks like your uh, <clears throat> you know, connection is not stable. But I would like to propose uh, the second speaker, Jim, uh, step in to present first. Okay, okay. All right, well, sorry about the, some of the troubles there, but um, first of all, uh, 
Professor uh, Choi, thank you very much for uh, inviting us to be here today. It's really an honor uh, to have a chance to present here at the uh, Stanford Storage X uh, uh, Industrial Panel. Uh, let me just uh, begin by speaking a little bit about applied materials. Uh, applied materials is a actually a material engineering company. We're most known for designing and building high volume manufacturing equipment for the semiconductor and display industries. And I think when you look at uh, you know, uh, some of these numbers on this page here, the one that we're most proud of internally at least is uh, our commitment to R&D spending. We spent over $2 billion last year. Uh, in fact, if you look over the last decade, we've historically always put in more than 10% of revenue directly back into R&D so we can continue to develop uh, new, uh, really innovative solutions and bring those to uh, the market. But uh, Applied is more than just a semiconductor and display equipment company. We actually have a division in Germany which develops roll-to-roll, vacuum-based roll-to-roll equipment. And in fact, we are the uh, world's leading supplier of uh, this type of technology. Uh, in the background in the picture here, you can see some of these tools. We can handle substrates that are up to four meters wide and processing at some incredible speeds up to uh, 30 meters per second. So this really supports, uh, this type of manufacturing supports a, a large number of different industries uh, and for very, very high volumes. If we look at some of the types of processing we do uh, with this roll-to-roll -roll equipment, we have platforms for thermal evaporation, e-beam evaporation, sputtering, as well as uh, CVD. And I'm actually part of our CTO organization. Our job in the CTO group is to try to leverage some of the real strengths and capabilities we have at Applied Materials and look for new and adjacent markets where we might be able to use those uh, capabilities. And as we look at some of these new industries, we're always trying to target inflection points, somewhere where there's gonna be a change and that change as an opportunity for Applied Materials to bring in a new solution, uh, particularly an enabling solution. Uh, all of these industries here you can see have a lot of excitement going on right now and a number of key inflection points that we're looking at. So what is the one inflection point that we're quite excited about right now in energy storage? And that's really fast charge. Uh, we really believe that fast charge is an absolute game changer. Uh, and when we're talking fast charge, we're thinking about five minute charge, something equivalent to what you would see today if you went to you know, the gas station. Uh, and if we had that capability, it would eliminate range anxiety. I personally drive a 2013 Nissan Leaf. I get about 70 miles of charge each day. Uh, if I go to work and then I take my daughter to softball practice, I have to drive home on the freeway no more than about 55 miles an hour to make sure I can get it all the way home. Uh, and there are a couple of days where I didn't quite make it. Uh, so this range anxiety thing I know is real uh, and I would sure love a, a fast charge solution. Uh, besides addressing the issue with uh, just anxiety, there's a very big economic benefit to fast charge. If you look at the trend uh, these days with electric vehicles, uh, the battery packs are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So you always hear that the cost of batteries are going down, but with larger and larger packs, the overall cost isn't necessarily getting any cheaper for these electric vehicles. Um, if you look at uh, Nissan Leafs today, uh, from the 70 miles that I get, uh, current models are about 150 to 220 miles. You have the Tesla Model 3, the high end, they're about 350 miles. And then 
Uh, what really surprised me, uh, Lucid Motors has come out and announced a 517 mile per charge uh, battery pack. Uh, as you can imagine, extremely expensive pack. As soon as uh, fast charge is available and out there, I think we'll see, immediately see the opposite trend. People will go to smaller and smaller packs. That will make this EV technology much more competitive with your traditional gas-based internal combustion engine and really accelerate adoption. Now, when you combine fast charge with high energy density batteries, uh, we believe there's another enabling uh, application and that is for the long haul freight market. Uh, I don't know if some of you might've seen a blog recently written by Bill Gates, where he said electric vehicles are great, but they're not gonna work very well for the long haul freight market because the batteries are just too heavy. You have so many batteries for that it would be used that all of the weight would be used moving the batteries around instead of moving the actual freight. Uh, so with high energy density batteries, and we're looking at about here, about a 30% reduction in weight, you're talking about thousands of pounds that you free up to actually move the load and make this an economically viable solution. So what technology can enable fast charge? If you look at uh, kind of a, a standard industry roadmap of improvements in lithium ion battery uh, technology, you'll typically see something like this. With the current lithium ion battery technology based on a graphite anode, and then a next generation uh, with, you'll see the addition of silicon, and that can either be 100% silicon as Dr. Sun was talking about earlier today uh, with Amprius, or some people are taking silicon and blending it, or silicon or a silicon oxide, and blending it with graphite, anywhere from 15 to 90 percent of silicon in those cases. And then the other technology we hear a lot about is solid state batteries, of course. Uh, that's always tends to be in the news these days. Um, but uh, the technology that really lends itself best to fast charge is silicon. And I'll talk a little bit today about some of the challenges of fast charge with graphite. And then I'll talk about uh, why uh, silicon uh, lends itself to be a very good solution for fast charge. So how does silicon uh, help enable fast charge? First of all, let's take a look at graphite. What are some of the fundamental challenges uh, with graphite? And again, Dr. Sun mentioned earlier the low capacity that you get with graphite. Typical usable capacity in the 290 milliamp hour per gram range. The downside there is when you're designing your battery, you have to have a very thick electrode. Uh, in order to uh, uh, get the capacity that you're looking for. Uh, and the lithium ions literally need to travel all the way through that thick electrode. Uh, and it just effectively takes time. One of the other side effects, and particularly when you're discharging, would because the lithium ion has to travel uh, through longer distances, that reduces the loading that you would design your battery to. And that's uh, typically in milliamp hours per centimeter squared. We'll talk about where loading comes into effect a little bit later. One of the second challenges with graphite is the slow intercalation rate. Uh, the graphites, uh, graphite is typically in planes, and so the lithium ions travel in effectively a two dimensions uh, in order to intercalate. Uh, the problem is if you try to charge faster than the natural intercalation rate of graphite, you will start to pile up lithium on the surface. You will start to then plate lithium and you run the risk of getting dendrites that could short your anode and cathode. The third fundamental challenge with graphite is the voltage itself of graphite 
is very near the plating potential of lithium. Another reason why uh, it's very dangerous here uh, and it's relatively easy to plate out and get those dendrites. I have a little animation here to kind of show you uh, what happens here. So in a regular uh, relatively slow charging rate, your lithium ions will basically go from your cathode to your anode and then come on back. And you'll notice that there are six carbon atoms for every one lithium atom. And that's why you end up having such a thick uh, graphite anode in order to handle the capacity, absorb the, the lithium. If you try to go a little bit faster, you run the risk of that lithium plating out on the surface. You get a dendrite that shorts, things go boom. That's not a good thing. So something that, that designers and batteries have to be very, very careful about with graphite. Now with silicon or a silicon oxide, uh, first of all, you have a much higher capacity. And we typically look at usable capacity of silicon oxide in the 1200 range, uh, silicon in the 1600 range, although some companies are seeing much higher numbers, closer to theoretical. I think uh, actually Amprius with their very unique design there with their nanowire uh, are getting some uh, uh, capacities much closer to theoretical than uh, some of these uh, more practical numbers. Um, but this gives you the benefit of being able to design a much thinner electrode that reduces the diffusion length and diffusion time of lithium. It also gives you an option to design with higher loading uh, without compromising your charge and discharge rates. Second thing is the silicon actually alloys as opposed to intercalates and it's effectively a 3D uh, kind of alloying reaction which in and of itself is much, much, much faster. And the third thing is the voltage is a little bit different. You're at about 400 millivolts. Uh, and so you can charge up to about 70, 80% very state of charge, much faster without risking that plating effect. So let's take a look at a quick animation here. Uh, what happens when I try to fast charge? Now, first thing that's interesting is the lithium will go, will alloy, with the silicon initially, and then the slower uh, graphite intercalation will typically happen. Uh, and as you can see on the side, you have four lithiums for every one silicon, and that's why you get such a higher energy density with, uh, with the addition of lithium. Uh, sorry, with the addition of silicon. Okay, uh, so that's great, but you know nothing comes for free. There are, of course, technical challenges that need to be addressed when you're uh, putting silicon into your anode. And one of the first ones people see is a silicon expansion effect or swelling. Um, when silicon reacts with lithium, it can expand up to 300%. And this is something the battery designers need to take into account. Um, Dr. Sun showed you a picture of their silicon nanowire design. And if you look at that carefully, there's room, there's some space in between each of those nanowires. Uh, and that's a very uh, impressive way to address uh, this effect, this swelling effect. It's a very nice design. Uh, other companies have addressed that other ways. Zen Labs will talk a little bit about what they've done to address that swelling effect a little bit later. Cycle life is always critical, especially with this expansion and swelling effect, you can get degradation of some of the material. Uh, and so uh, cycle life is critical. Uh, getting cycle life is critical for that reason. Uh, you, you saw Dr. King also talk about the electrolytes and compatibility with silicon is very crucial. Otherwise you'll do degradation in cycle life there as well. So this is something that must be addressed uh, uh, in the device design and in the materials used. Calendar life, uh, and you'll see some actually uh, some data, I think both from Dr. Sun as well as from uh, Dr. Uh, Kumar uh, from Zen Labs on uh, cycle life. Calendar life, 10 years, uh, again, similar to cycle life needs to be addressed through device integration. This is something that uh, I think the industry is still working on getting to that full 10 year number. I haven't seen data achieve that quite yet. 
although uh, Dr. Kumar will talk uh, uh, about that and show some data on what they've achieved to date. Another challenge is this first cycle irreversible lithium loss. And this is something that I will uh, talk about uh, uh, in just a minute. Um, what happens is the first time lithium goes over, the first time you charge up your battery, um, not all the lithium that goes over comes back. And on this graph here, we can see where we charge up. And then as we discharge, we see about a 40%, up to a 40% loss of lithium. Uh, it really defeats the whole purpose of adding silicon into your anode when you have this much loss. But there are ways to overcome that. Uh, and actually, Dr. Sun just started talking about pre-lithiation there before uh, uh, he got cut off. So I'll talk a little bit more about that and uh, explain what can be done to overcome this first cycle loss. And then the last thing, and this is critical for every, any new battery technology, you got to be cost competitive with graphite. And we believe that we can actually achieve cost parity uh, with the right solution of high volume manufacturing equipment and some taking advantage of uh, some of the inherent uh, capabilities of silicon to improve your cell design that can help get you uh, cost. Okay, so let's take a quick uh, little animation at what's happening with this first cycle irreversible lithium loss. So the lithium goes on over. And when it does the first time, you're forming an SEI layer uh, and you have some kind of dead and lost lithium uh, that occurs in the bulk. Uh, and depending on whether you're using silicon or silicon oxide in the concentrations, the amount of uh, lithium you lose can change, as I mentioned, anywhere from one to about 40%. Uh, and that's obviously a, a big challenge. With the pre-lithiation process, there's a number of different ways you can pre-lithiate your anode. Uh, the method that we're using is just literally adding some excess lithium to the silicon graphite anode. So we have a lithium source and we're adding somewhere between two to about 10 microns worth of lithium to the anode. And this is what, uh, the last one is a cartoon, but this is actually a picture. You're looking at a top view here on your left and a side view on your right. This is a mixture of graphite particles with silicon particles. And we have added uh, a few microns of lithium to it. The way that we do it, it is a top down kind of line of sight deposition process. Uh, when we did this particular fib cut, we did not have an environmental, we did not have this in an environmentally controlled chamber. So the lithium itself reacted, but the nice thing is the lithium turned white. And so we can kind of see that contrast here of that lithium on the top and the graphite and the silicon beneath it. Now, you don't wanna have that lithium just sitting there on the top. Actually, you want that lithium to react to uh, alloy with the, uh, with the silicon and intercalate with the graphite. And what's nice is when you add the electrolyte, that will just naturally happen in literally in a matter of just minutes. So there's no extra manufacturing process steps are needed, just in that standard manufacturing flow, you'll get this reaction to occur. You'll actually form the SEI layer there uh, or start to form the SEI layer uh, on the uh, anode. Uh, and then when you go through your charge and discharge cycles, you can uh, achieve up to 100% of the capacity back without any further loss uh, in capacity. And what we're showing here, this is some coin cell data that we've done at Applied Materials. We made some devices without prelithiation and then some devices with prelithiation. And in this particular case, we had about a 20% loss without prelithiation, but we were able to recover 100% of that with the prelithiation process. We've done a large number of demos with uh, um, different uh, battery manufacturers around the world. And we're seeing that uh, we can recover generally between 90 
to 90% to 100% uh, recovery with this pre-lactation process consistently. In some cases, we're actually able to get over 100%, which means we probably put too much lithium down there, uh, but it is possible. Um, uh, we see this as a very effective method to overcome uh, that issue. So when you're doing a process like this and you're trying to deposit a very thin amount of lithium in that two to 10 micron range, it can be very challenging. Uh, and some of the critical things that you want to see uh, is that you can get a very good uniform film, very smooth, and you want it to be very high quality lithium. What we're showing a picture of here is the deposition of lithium directly on copper. Um, we're not, we, this is not on a silicon graphite um, anode, just because it's a lot easier to see uh, the, the lithium in this case and get a visual um, cue on the quality of that film, the smoothness, uh, the uniformity, et cetera. Now, when you're, when you're processing lithium, lithium is an extremely reactive material. Uh, it can be flammable and at high temperatures it is actually explosive with, with, uh, with water. And so you have to be very, very careful. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we use roll-to-roll -roll equipment uh, as vacuum-based. And so the uh, lithium material is never exposed uh, to the environment or to the people uh, during processing. Uh, the equipment, as I mentioned earlier, we can scale this equipment uh, to greater than meter wide as needed uh, for depending on the, the size of the substrates that are used. And if you run this at high speeds and you get very high efficiency of the lithium, it can be a very cost effective solution as well. So let me just kind of show you some, some numbers here really quick. We use the BATPAC model from Argonne National Labs to model out the cost of a traditional graphite uh, based anode. This is using NMC cathode and a loading of about three milliamp hours per centimeter squared. And we're baselining that at 100%. When we replace some of the graphite with a silicon oxide here for this model, we used 30% silicon oxide. Keep the loading the same. You have the benefits of less mass. I talked earlier about that energy density uh, gains you have. So you have about 13% less mass, 22% less volume, but you're paying about a four to 5% premium for that, which doesn't sound too bad uh, considering the benefits that you have. But we still hear from our customers, no, we want it to be at the same cost as graphite. And here's where you have to take advantage of the nature of silicon. Now, I made the comment earlier that you can increase the loading with uh, silicon uh, with the introduction of silicon. And so going from three milliamp hours per centimeter squared, you have the ability to go up to, let's say four and a half milliamp hours per centimeter squared. And at that loading, you, you actually use less inactive materials. So you can use less separator material, less copper, less aluminum, less electrolytes. And so because of all the savings that you get there, you can get to cost parity with graphite, but you still have the benefits of fast charge, uh, increased uh, energy, uh, gravimetric energy, energy density, volumetric energy density at that cost parity level. Now, I'm always very skeptical of other people's cost models. Um, and I'm sure <laughs> you can be skeptical of mine. So one thing that we're doing, uh, we're working with Argonne National Labs. Their current backpack model actually does not have an extension for, for silicon. We had to uh, do this ourselves, but we're working with them uh, actually through a, a DOE grant, uh, EERE grant, to go ahead and update their model. And then once they're done updating the model, they'll make that available for everybody. Uh, and that will allow each of you out there to run your own models and see how uh, those costs work for you. Okay, so you know, in summary, when we're looking at a comparison of a you know, silicon and a silicon oxide anode to graphite, we start comparing some of these key
parameters and charge time, energy density, cost effectiveness, scalability to high volume manufacturing and safety, um, we do see that there are a number of benefits going to silicon. There's still a little bit more work to do here to get this ready and scale to high volume manufacturing, but we feel that uh, the solutions are there. Uh, the high volume manufacturing capability is there. Uh, and we just need to see more uh, proof in the performance, especially in that cycle life and such. Uh, Kang, uh, we have a new way for you to, to present. Uh, I think Justin have talked to you about, uh, let's uh, move on to Kang first. Sujit, if you don't mind, uh, you, you go after Kang. Okay, sorry about the interruption. So uh, here, I uh, just uh, quickly go through my slides. Uh, this slide shows uh, even a separator, we have to select a special separator. We actually customize the separator for our uh, silicon anode, uh, uh, silicon anode here, okay, particularly for uh, silicon nanowire uh, anode materials. Okay, I just talk about this one. So this is our application slides here. This is a vertical uh, takeoff of drone material, uh, drones. You can see the, uh, our annual performance in terms of uh, read capability okay, from C over five to all the way to three C. This battery is 725 a wire, uh, gave a 415 wire per kilo. So uh, all the, uh, the battery I present here are commercialized the batteries, are the customer orders, uh, not, a, not a laboratory samples. Uh, we also have a collaboration with USABC uh, in EV battery uh, design and the development. This is a 60 ampere hour battery uh, cycled at a C over C rate at a 30 degree. This particular battery has a 450 watt per kilo and a 1200 watt per liter energy density. This, uh, um, based on the information we have, uh, this is a, about 50% higher specific energy than the best EV cells today. Okay, this one uh, also can charge to 80% capacity uh, within 15 minutes. So this is uh, uh, <coughs> our production line. This is the pilot and this small line uh, um, for silicon manual anode. So for silicon nanowire anode manufacturing process, uh, we don't have a powder mixing, we don't have a slurry preparation, uh, we even don't have a coating, okay, no drying, we don't need a calendaring, uh, we have a bare foil in, and on the other side, you have finished the silicon nanowire anode. So the picture in the bottom, you can see this is the entire uh, structure of this, uh, Machine. This is the first, only the only row to row deposition uh, equipment, which gave precision 3D double side silicon nanowire growth uh, fabrication capability. Now, here uh, we uh, compare some of our own products uh, with the competitive technology, which is lithium metal. Okay, in terms of energy density, this probably. Uh, and the most competitive technology to silicon anode technology. So on the left hand side is our silicon carbon and silicon graphite composite anode performance. Uh, in the middle is a lithium metal uh, solid state battery performance, the information we collect. Okay, on, the uh, on the right is our silicon uh, nanowire anode battery performance. Now, Amprius has commercialized the silicon graphite composite anode battery back to 2014. We started commercializing our silicon nanowire anode batteries in 2018. If you read the news, you probably, you probably uh, uh, know the Airbus was our first customer. Those are the, some customer designed uh, uh, batteries for uh, various applications. So our uh, energy density from high 300s all the way to middle 400s. So end of this year, uh, we will have a high 400 
in terms of our per kilo battery ready. Next year, we, would, uh, we are planning to introduce 500 watt per kilo. Those are all not laboratory curiosities. All those are commercial uh, uh, product with customer orders. This is our roadmap. Okay, we have very detailed roadmap, but uh, in this occasion, I just uh, uh, present this uh, uh, outline here. So today, uh, uh, we already achieved the 450. Uh, we demonstrated the 500, but the 500 is not a uh, commercialized product. So next year, uh, we already promised our customer we will have 500 watt per kilo uh, silicon nanowire anode materials available. For silicon graphite anode material, uh, we already produce 350 watt per kilo commercial product for sale. Uh, we're shooting for 380 watt per kilo next year for silicon graphite uh, composite anode material. We believe, okay, based on our model, we believe uh, in two or three years, we should be able to reach about 700 watt per kilo. Okay, this is partially based on our uh, silicon structure, our electrochemical system, and partially uh, based on the uh, advancement of a new cathode materials. Now this just show, uh, a few months ago, we demonstrated the 510 watt per kilo in the lab. We uh, have planned to commercialize this material for uh, select customers in 2021. Currently, uh, Ampere's has four operating companies. Uh, we have uh, Ampere's technology based on in Fremont, California, focused on high energy density uh, battery based on silicon nanowire anode technology. We also have Ampere's Nanjing uh, is making, uh, developing and making silicon graphite anode material. Ampere's Wuxi is our battery company a company produces battery cells. Uh, recently, we also have a pack capability. Uh, then, the, on the, uh, then the new company we have is called Ampere's Energy. Ampere's Energy uh, is working on, at this moment, primarily working on electrical transportation. We make a battery for marine vessels and the electrical vehicles. Yeah, we are planning to have an energy storage business, but we have not started yet. Yeah, we're inviting the audience to be partner of Ampere's. We like to uh, make our technology become the mainstream technology. Our product becomes a mainstream product. We, we need a lot of partners. Of course, we need the customers. We need the suppliers, manufacturer, tool manufacturing partners, equipment and manufacturing partners. Yeah, we also need the bankers and the investors to help us uh, to be successful. So this concludes my uh, presentation. The next page, please. Uh, before I finish, okay, I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, Dr. Yunel Stefan and um, uh, Dr. Michael Wang. They pro produced this data for me to make this presentation. This is my contact information here. You also can reach me and can reach Professor Yi Chui for additional information. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kang. Uh, I apologize for the uh, technical issues. Now uh, you managed to be able to present smoothly in the second part. Uh, now let's move on to uh, Suji Kuma. Suji, are you ready? Please. Yes, I am. Yeah, good. And again, uh, thanks a lot uh, to Stanford Storage Team for the invitation. Um, the title of my talk is uh, Fast Charging Lithium Ion Battery Performance using silicon-based anode. Yeah, so just to briefly introduce our company, um, at Zen Labs, our mission is to develop high energy, fast charging, and low cost lithium ion batteries for electric and aerial vehicles. Um, we are based right here in Fremont, California, and we have a cell prototyping center in Jiaxing, China, where we make uh, 10 amp hour to 50 amp hour uh, pouch cells for uh, electric and aerial vehicles. 
Our technology is based on silicon-based anode, um, which can be paired with nickel-rich cathode to achieve up to 400 watt hour per kilogram lithium ion cells. And we're very proud to be working with the tier one uh, customers in the US, in Europe, uh, to bring our technology uh, for commercialization. And our business model is simple. Uh, we would like to see our technology go everywhere and we want to license our technology. Uh, uh, manufacturing is very hard. So we focus on technology development and we are a very IP centric company uh, with 40 issued patent. This is the battery roadmap uh, for electric vehicles published by Lux Research. Uh, today, conventional lithium ion battery, they use NMC cathode um, and graphite based anode as previous two speakers talked about. Um, advanced lithium ion will start to replace conventional lithium ion in year 2025, and they will have a runaway for 10 years before solid state battery and lithium sulfur battery comes to market. Again, you know, um, if, if you look at solid state batteries, uh, you know, the consumer electronics there, um, you know, the specs are not as challenging as automotive and they really care about high watt hour per liter. Solid state has the highest watt hour per liter, but they do not meet all the other specs. That's why when you go and buy your next smartphone, it will still be powered by a graphite based anode. More recently, uh, some of the companies have started adding, uh, you know, 10% to 20% silicon to graphite to boost the energy. But, you know, at least for next five years, when you buy your next electric cars, it will be powered by NMC cathode and a graphite based anode, maybe 5% to 10% silicon, you know, mixed in graphite. So we believe our silicon based anode will be a critical part of advanced lithium ion solution. And um, as Dr. Kangsan talked about, silicon has two fundamental problems. It has a very poor cycle life and a very high swelling. We have solved these two problems and we have demonstrated halogen cycles uh, meeting a key electric vehicle requirement. We have a different approach and these are the set of solutions that we propose. Uh, we do not use nano size, we use micron size, very low surface area, uh, you know, silicon monoxide based anode. We have our own proprietary electrode formulation using a very high strength binder that keeps silicon monoxide glued to the current collector, a carbon nanotube network that as SIU expands, contracts, you know, it still maintains uh, electronic connectivity. And Jim talked about pre -lithiation. So, you know, like all these, there are lots of advantages of silicon monoxide. It has one disadvantage that it has high irreversible capacity loss. And that's where, you know, pre helps solve that. And we also have our own proprietary electrolyte. And then again, um, we are riding on the same supply chain, uh, you know, same graphite electrolyte supplier, just giving them our formulation and our additives uh, that helps improve cycle life. Uh, the benefit is enormous. You get four times more capacity than graphite. And again, we are not like going after 10 times capacity of graphite because uh, we believe at four times of graphite, we are providing significant advantage to our customers. And uh, we are able to meet all the specs, not just few selective specs. It gives you very high energy and also uh, very high fast charge, uh, Jim talked about, so I will not go in, into the details. But one of the big advantage of silicon monoxide is its low cost. You know, you could have very attractive technology for automakers. If your cost is not below $100 per kilowatt hour, they will not even talk to you. You will keep wandering around in their R&D department. But if you really want to see your technology commercialized, you, your cost be better be less than $100 per kilowatt hour. And that's thanks for Jim. Uh, he shared all the cost model with pre lithiation that you know, it can be easily integrated with the existing lithium ion batteries. And the point I make is that silicon monoxide is sand. You know, it's present in every continent. So the cost is rapidly coming down. 
um, you know, the vendors we talk to in Asia, now there's several vendors, not just one, but multiple vendors. Uh, some, of them have, uh, some of them have already scaled to thousand tons a year. And they are promising us that in a few years, the price of silicon oxide will be same as price of graphite. So now think of that. We are riding on the you know, same chain, uh, supply chain, and we have a material with a cost parity with graphite, but four times more capacity. That's how we are bringing the cost down. Um, you know, what are the advantage of pre-lithiation is that, of, of course, you can compensate the irreversible capacity loss, but you can also control anode potential. So this is a three electrode cell study, uh, you know, um, with the reference electrode and uh, you know, we have electrode with no pre-lithiation and with different levels of pre-lithiation. So if you want to get a uh, you know, long cycle life, you need to keep your anode potential below 0 0.7 volt. And in our case, we are keeping uh, close to 0 0.5 volt. So if you're below that, you don't see you know, poor cycle life or very high swelling. And this is a picture of, you know, uh, uh, you know, a lithium deposited on top of our silicon anode. I want to share our swelling data. Uh, this data is from one amp hour pouch cell, uh, which is not clamped. It's a freestanding, and just you can put a meter to your gaze and you know monitor its thickness change, and you fully charge and discharge the battery. Uh, most you know, like smartphone makers, they want you your swelling to be below eight percent because. If you have too much swelling, it will pop up the device. Uh, even graphite has 3% to 4% swelling. We have managed to bring down to 7% that you know, from fully discharged battery to fully charged battery, it goes up to 7%. And we continue to improve on swelling. This is our roadmap with silicon anode. Uh, today, you know, uh, the pouch cell leaders, uh, they use NCM622 cathode and graphite-based anode, and you can achieve up to 240 watt per kilogram. This is what you will see if you buy a Chevy Bolt. Uh, you know, um, uh, the battery cell energy density is 240 watt per kilogram. If we drop in, you know, um, our silicon anode in the same system, we achieve 315 watt per kilogram. And of course, we had to do lots of technology solutions to make it go all the way to 1,000 cycles. That was the big challenge. And we have 15 minute to 90% capacity. Uh, now, the trend is to keep making nickel rich. So cathode from 60% nickel is becoming 80% nickel, and you get more capacity. Uh, so with 8.1 cathode, we can achieve up to 350 watt per kilogram. And here, I want to make a point that we are not limited by the anode capacity. I mean, our electrode is already one third the thickness of you know, graphite-based anode. Uh, it's the cathode that needs to you know, be improved upon. Um, right now, we can find a high capacity cathode. So we are taking same 811 to high 4.3 volt, uh, but the issue that you, know, it, you can only cycle 250 times. So we have built batteries all the way from 315 watt hour per kilogram uh, to 400 watt hour per kilogram. And I will show data on this. So we are very grateful to USABC award, uh, which will lead to commercialization of our EV cells. Uh, in our first program, uh, we built a 350, uh, 315 watt hour per kilogram battery with 1,000 cycles and fast charge. And this was very successful. And as soon as we completed this award, we're very grateful we got the second contract where we are using 811 to qualify a 350 watt hour per kilogram battery. But most importantly, lower the cost. Like you know, I mentioned, automakers care a lot about the cost. You cannot bring a solution uh, that is very costly. Uh, they will just, you know, like I said, it will be an R&D curiosity inside you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the auto world, but they will not commercialize the technology if you have a very high cost. So that's why we are very much you know, uh, in the favor of silicon monoxide. And we do believe that uh, $75 per kilowatt hour is challenging, but possible. And 
of course, like the fast charge is a big benefit of silicon based anode. And uh, our last remaining challenge is calendar life. And uh, I will show some data based on that. Uh, this is something we're very proud of. Uh, it's a 12 amp hour pouch cell uh, using 622 cathode and cell has been cycling at 100% depth of discharge, going all the way to 4.3 volt and 2.5 volt at lower cutoff. It's a one hour charge and, and one hour discharge. So some of these, this data takes almost eight to nine months to collect if you do you know, three hour charge, three hour discharge. So we are very proud of this data. We think like we are the first one to put some of this data in public domain. And most importantly, you know, as a part of the USCBC program, uh, we submit our cells, same set of cells that we tested. It goes to national labs and they do a testing. Now, in the previous data, I showed you constant current, constant voltage cycling. Auto guys, they care about DST cycling. It stands for dynamic stress test. You can go to USABC website and it's a very complicated you know, test profile which reflects the real life you know, usage of electric car. You know, it, it will not be simple, uh, you know, a two hour discharge or three hour discharge. So uh, our cells have been cycling at national labs uh, under DST conditions and RPT is like a reference performance test. Each RPT is close to about 110 DST cycles. So they reported nine, 990 DST cycles. Uh, this is the data from my first USCBC program where we had some issues with the calendar life uh, being tested at 30C, 40C, 50C. And uh, some cells had to be removed uh, because you know, of, of like outgassing. This is the charge rate test. So, you know, like typically you charge battery for three hours to five hours. That's what, you know, most of the electric cars do today. But our lithium cells, you know, uh, in 15 minutes, it can be charged to 90% capacity. In 10 minutes, it can be charged to 80% of the capacity. Now, why I'm using 15%? Because that's the goal of USABC. So we work very closely with USABC and you know, our goals are to meet or exceed 80% you know, at 15 minutes of charge. Again, this is the verification of fast charge by National Lab. So again, they are testing our 11.7 amp hour cell and 50 amp hour pouch cell. Um, so it's their comment that uh, you know, we achieved 90%, they demonstrated 88% to 93% uh, charge in 15 minutes. Now you also notice that they reported temperature rise because fast charge is a very dangerous condition for lithium ion cells. It's very, you know, it's easy to do one time, but can you do a thousand times? Uh, because it's a very degrading condition for the battery. Uh, so like, you know, as you see at the bottom, um, the temperature rise is about 45 centigrade. Uh, during fast charge condition. And again, we had demonstrated on both 11.7 amp power cell and 50 amp power cell. So, you know, like I was saying, the fast charge condition degrades your battery. You know, like you are quickly charging, quickly discharging. So in this test, we are doing a 4C charge, a 15 minute charge, and, there, and we are discharging at one hour rate. At every 50 cycles, we are doing a capacity check. You know, this capacity check is at one hour charge and one hour discharge rate. And, you know, um, we, are, we, we got about 750 cycles at, uh, you know, using the slope. So that's something we're very proud of that, you know, like uh, we have solved the battery degradation issues related to fast charge uh, because, you know, we, even today, the superchargers, they won't let you charge thousand times. Uh, they have the BMS and, you know, they will, you know, stop, you know, fast charge once you exceed certain threshold number of, you know, fast charge cycles, because it is really bad for the batteries. But we are projecting 1,000 fast charge cycles. That's why our slogan is every charge, fast charge. And again, this is the verification uh, of our fast charging data by national labs. You know, like I said, we submit our cells as a part of the USABC program. 
And right now, the automakers, GM, Ford, Chrysler, they are very interested in understanding the consumer profile. So they are studying at 0% fast charge condition, 25% fast charge condition, and 100% fast charge condition. So as you notice and the comment that, you know, if you have 100% fast charge condition, um, it's close to 17.7% fade. Uh, you know, it's the green line at the bottom and the yellow line is 0% fast charge. So now, you know, like the fast charge condition is, is degrading uh, you know, more than the 0%. But also I want to make a point that cells continue to cycle. So right now I'm showing 763 DST fast charge cycles into actual real life you know, automotive condition. Um, the test is ongoing. Um, this data is from our last month USABC meeting uh, where we got this updated cycling. Uh, based on this slope, we think we will have 1,000 fast charge cycles, and that's our goal. Then also you notice that uh, cells are being tested at 30C, 40C, 50C to project a calendar life because you know, these batteries need to have 10 years of calendar life. And uh, there's a model like you, know, uh, you test for at least a year, a minimum one year uh, at different temperatures. Then you project uh, what's your battery life. So this is our last remaining challenge to solve the calendar life issues related to silicon-based anode. Uh, this is the thermal performance. You know, like they say, your battery pack has to work in Alaska and in Arizona. USABC specs are at minus 20 degrees C to 52 degrees C. And uh, the spec says that you must have at least 70% of energy at minus 20 centigrade. So we exceed that, we have 73% of energy. And this is where uh, solid state batteries are measurable. They barely work at room temperature and they cannot meet spec at minus 20 centigrade. Uh, we're also working very closely with most of the eVTOL makers because they care about high energy as well as high power. You know, as you can see in the hover mode, they need very high power. So during the liftoff, they need high power for a few minutes as they climb. And then during the cruise mode, they need high energy. So that's where silicon anode has tremendous advantage. Uh, you know, it has fast charge capability. Uh, it has a high power capability. And, uh, you know, and again, during liftoff and landing, it can provide very high power. Um, so we are, engaged with uh, some of the leading players of eVTOL and uh, our technology can enable a 300 kilometer range eVTOL. Uh, and here the usable energy is very important. So we can have a high energy of 350, 400, 450, but usable energy is defined where you meet the power numbers. Say for example, uh, when, you, no, when you have this eVTOL flying for one hour, and now your battery has depleted to 80%, try getting high power when the battery has been depleted at 80% SO, no, state of charge. It's a very tough problem. And that's where silicon anode shines, that even when battery has been depleted close to 80%, it can uh, provide good power. And of course the fast charge is very good because you, know, uh, you have companies like Uber Elevate talking about air taxi, and uh, you know, with the uh, with the air taxi, you know, you need fast charge, ten minute charge, fifteen minute charge, so that you can take off for the next flight. Um, so we have a four hundred watt per kilogram cell. Like I said, uh, we are cycling is limited by cathode, not by the anode. Our anode can cycle thousand times. And if you are to collaborate with a nickel rich cathode company uh, who can stabilize it thousand times, we can have an automotive cell that cycles thousand times at 400 watt per kilogram. Um, finally, commercialization require meeting all the specs. And Zen Labs is focused on delivering on all the specs. Unless we meet all the specs, our technology cannot power automotive. It's as simple as that. You know, most of the companies, they highlight a very high watt per kilogram or very high watt per liter, but again, you know, 
today you can go and buy the next generation smartphone it will have 5g capability but if you open the lithium battery it is still powered by graphite anode why is that you know sony introduced lithium ion battery in 1991 30 years later still lithium ion cells use lithium cobalt oxide and graphite same chemistry introduced by sony and these are very innovative trillion dollar companies uh, they have all the resources in the world but they still use lithium cobalt oxide and graphite it's because of this slide they want you to meet every spec not just watt per kilogram and watt per liter so if you're a solid state battery company you highlight your watt per liter because that's where you shine you don't highlight your cost or you don't highlight your low temperature performance same thing a lithium sulfur battery company they would highlight 600 watt per kilogram but they will not talk about high temperature performance now even for transporting your battery you need to pass un 38.3 test which means you need to test your battery at 60 centigrade at least 10 cycles sulfur melting point is 115 centigrade and you need to test a fully charged battery at 60 c you know like even when we talk to company like volkswagen daimler not just usabc even volkswagen wants to put your battery fully charged at 60 c for 300 days so that's where it's not not every technology qualifies and unless you can deliver on all the specs you cannot put your technology on the road you know automotive is a very conservative industry and uh, you know um, a battery recall can lead to billion dollars in losses so that's why it's important to meet all the specs if you dream to put your technology in electric cars so we understand the challenge uh, we understand the difficulty and uh, you know uh, that's why we really believe in partnership with national labs who are keeping us honest who are testing our batteries giving us feedback and we are very grateful to the usabc um, our final deliverable is you know um, quarter 2 2021 and we believe we will deliver a 350 watt per kilogram beginning of life pouch cell and um, fast charge 15 minute we will demonstrate thousand fast charge cycles every charge fast charge our last big challenge is calendar life uh, we have to demonstrate 10 years and and of course the cost has to be below 100 dollars per kilowatt hour and again we are working on the calendar life we already have very strong data on coin cells and you know single layer power cells uh, we don't like to present data from single layer power cells because that's just research curiosity we love to present data on 50 amp power cells and you know as a part of usabc we attend annual merit review and we like to put our data in public domain uh, that's required for every doe award recipient so you will see lots of our data and annual merit review conference in washington dc and we feel that's the way to go very quickly i think um, i just want to thank usabc and all the national labs and with this i conclude my talk thank you thank thank you sujit uh <laughs> Let me uh, invite all our panelists back to have a discussion. Kang and Jim, uh, please uh, come back to the stage. I also invite my uh, co-director, Professor William Chair, back to the stage. It was really exciting. Um, it's certainly silicon and now silicon related high energy and fast charging is the dearest topic to my heart. You know, 15 years ago, I started to work on this topic. I'm glad to see there's so much progress, very exciting on the high energy as well as fast charging. Uh, I'm going to let my co-director, uh, Will, to ask uh, you the first question. Thank you for that really energetic set of talks. I really enjoyed it, no pun intended. <laughs> um, e, maybe if I could, I'll ask two set of questions. Please. So today's talk had a major theme of taking silicon technology from lab to product and it's not finished yet and you all spoke about the challenges of scaling up whether it is in the cell size or in the manufacturing batch size so the first question i want to ask you is which 
scale jump do you think is the toughest one? Um, maybe I can ask Jim to take this one first, uh, perhaps with the manufacturing side. Which, which of these scale is the hardest leap to cross? Um, uh, I'm not sure if that's a, a softball question or an impossible question for me, one of the two. Um, you know, I, Applied is really all about scale. Um, we, you know, uh, mentioned we, we build equipment for high volume manufacturing. Uh, we don't build lab equipment and we don't build R and D equipment. Uh, so, you know, everything we get into is really with that in mind. Um, and, uh, for the, you know, the technology that we're talking about here, if you look at, um, if you look at implementing uh, a silicon and silicon oxide anodes, there's two main steps. Uh, there's the silicon itself, replacing the graphite, and Sujit talked a little bit about scaling up uh, the silicon uh, silicon oxide supply chain. And then there's the additional step of prelithiation that we're working on. Uh, we see a very clear path uh, on the prelithiation side. Um, I, don't, I won't pretend like it's the easiest thing in the world, but uh, we think we have a very good approach in mind here. We've got enough uh, internal data that we feel very confident that is, it can be scaled. Uh, and we'll be ready, uh, you know, at gigawatt scale uh, very soon here. Connor, so, I think, so I don't think manufacturing will be the challenge. I think uh, I'll let uh, the other guys talk about the device scale up itself. Sajid, go ahead, please. All right. <laughs> um, again, you know, like uh, it's a very good question that how do you scale your technology to a large scale? And in our, in, in our case, you know, as a startup, you know, when you approach large automakers, they're always skeptical, you know, hey, how can a startup support a gigafactory? So nice thing in our case is we can walk to any gigafactory and provide them our formulation, silicon anode formulation. We are riding on, you know, same supply of silicon monoxide, but we need prelithiation. So our partnership with Applied is very critical that we need a large, you know, a capital equipment company like Applied uh, you know, show interest in prelithiation and they can calm down automakers who are building their own gigafactory, 10, giga 10 gigawatt hour to 60 gigawatt hour. So it really needs uh, a scale of applied materials uh, that can calm them down. So, but it's a very good question that, you know, somebody needs to support this gigafactory and who will that be, you know? So from our side, we need prelithiation. We have our own roll-to-roll -roll prelithiation in our own lab, but that's not good enough for Gigafactory. We need help from company like Applied Materials. <laughs> Thank you, Suji. <laughs> for us, for silicon graphite anode, uh, I don't see any uh, manufacturing scale up and the cost challenge. And our prelithiation actually is a dry powder prelithiation. Uh, we predisit uh, the material first, uh, then we code it. Okay, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a uh, predisit electro. However, for our uh, silicon nanowire, uh, we, uh, the, the key is to make the, uh, how we can uh, grow the silicon nanowire at a relatively high speed. Right. So uh, we have uh, uh, the, the, the equipment that I show you, this is our first generation. Our second generation in design, uh, we believe, okay, we did, we have the answer this is to some very large companies in the next few weeks. So uh, we have been designing the second generation for some time. Uh, it's COVID-19 didn't help us. So um, we think at a gigawatt level, okay, even the silicon nanoware can, can achieve a single digit per ampere hour cost. Uh, uh, so uh, the, in terms of present uh, prediction, we don't have large scale yet. You know, we, we have been talking to uh, applied material as well, but uh, uh, today we do have uh, in-house uh, continuous uh, uh, prediction protocol as well. Thank you, Khan. So it sounds like if I synthesize what all of you said is, one of the key bottlenecks is going to be high volume manufacturing equipment, um, which I think is good for you, Jim. Yes. <laughs> um, 
maybe this is a great segue to my, my second question. So academia has played a tremendous role in the commercialization of battery technologies of many kinds, and, and certainly for lithium-ion batteries. We have some of our uh, key innovators on the Zoom call right here, uh, such as Sam Wintingham. So the role of academia in spinning off and transferring technology to a commercial setting is uh, absolutely very clear. I was wondering if I can ask um, you to address the point of the role of academia in understanding the science of scaling up. I think it's often understood that academia spins off the technology, industry takes over to scale it up. But I sense there is a number of key scientific questions that requires an academic focus and lens. So I was wondering if you can talk about what might be some of the academic questions uh, that could be answered that can in turn help the scale of challenges, especially, for example, in high volume manufacturing. Would you like to go first? <laughs> uh, so go I'll, ahead. I'll, ju I'll jump in. Um, as uh, Professor Chui uh, announced at the beginning of uh, this uh, session, Applied Materials just joined the uh, Stanford Storage X initiative. Um, and we did that because we recognize there are a lot of questions uh, we still have about, um, about this technology uh, and, and, and about how to really optimize this technology um, and how to take it to the next level. Um, so, you know, we, we talked a little bit about prelithiation. I showed some nice little animations there where everything just works great in an animation, but fundamentally understanding exactly what's going on with the lithium when it's alloying and it's intercalating uh, and how to form the optimal SEI layer to get the best performance in cycle life, in calendar life, uh, at different temperature ranges, et cetera. Um, uh, those are very, very difficult technical questions. And that's part of why we joined uh, uh, the storage initiative. Um, and we know there's a lot more work that needs to be done to, to understand the, the fundamentals of, of what's going on here. Um, I think when you take that forward, we talked a little bit about solid state batteries uh, and really understanding what's going on at the interfaces between uh, the uh, electrolyte, especially a solid electrolyte, a lithium metal, uh, all kinds of crazy reactions are going on. There's a ton of, of work and understanding that still needs to be done. Uh, and we definitely need <laughs> the support of the uh, uh, great universities, uh, both in the US as well as around the world to better understand these things. Thank you, Jim. Akan, I was wondering, maybe you can offer us a few projects to work on. Do you have any exciting questions that you don't have bandwidth to answer on the science of scaling up? Uh, we, we do, uh, no, we do. Actually, we, uh, in, in addition to Professor Yi Cui, uh, we, have, uh, quite a, uh, we have quite a few interactions with academic and locally, okay, in, in our, uh, around our factory, in, uh, around our research labs. And one of the uh, uh, things we need, uh, uh, we spend a lot of time to do simulation modeling is how far silicon and the graphite anode can go. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's the question uh, we have been uh, trying to, uh, to figure out. Yeah, because we have not seen uh, very comprehensive, okay, good performance of a silicon graphite anode uh, in commercial market today. So that's that's a thing. Uh, actually, this, but uh, on the other hand, a silicon nanowire anode is very clear to us. Okay, there is a in terms of performance. Uh, even the cycling today, we only three hundred cycles. We believe we can get a cycle. We we'll, we believe we can get energy density. Only thing we need to overcome is. Uh, is the cost, is the manufacturing scalability. But for silicon graphite anode, okay, the anything is not 100% silicon. How can we? Okay, uh, the, you mix those two materials together, they behave totally different, right? They, 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 their potential, uh, their electrical potential are different. Okay, actually, we have, in, in terms of performance, we have a lot more difficulty to handle the silicon graphite anode than the silicon nanowire. 
So that's part of we spend, uh, we, we work with uh, um, two universities in Nanjing to ask them to do some experiment, uh, to, to do some exploration for us. So academic certainty can get us, guide us from a theoretical point of view, okay? That could save us a lot of energy and time. We may chase the ghost, okay? We want uh, uh, Professor Yi Chui and Stanford University and uh, other academic researchers to give us some guidance. Okay, uh, so if I had to jump in, so maybe, you know, at a small scale, like we really baby our lithium ion cells, you know? And uh, one of the critical thing is uh, solid electrolyte interface. Uh, we don't understand it well, but we are able to create a very strong SEI. So that's something worries me, that when you scale up, when you are making, you know, one gigawatt or so lithium ion batteries every year, when you're doing a very high speed pre-lithiation, uh, are you able to maintain same strong SEI? Now, first of all, we don't understand what the SEI is in silicon-based anode. So how do you maintain at a high speed, at a high volume? So that's something I believe academia like Stanford, or you know, we have also uh, collaborated with uh, LVML locally, that maybe they can help us understand what the heck is this SEI with silicon, you know? So we, you know, in our startup, we screen hundreds of electrolyte additives, hundreds of electrolyte formulation, but we don't understand when it works, why it works, what exactly is on the SEI. And this bothers me all the time that hey, what happens when we are doing it at a very, very high speed. So that's something we, we believe that, you know, um, universities, national labs can help us. Well, so gee, that it's music to, uh, to our ears. Uh, I know that there are tons of questions that have been sent to us. So maybe let me hand things back to E, um, and, and hopefully we will be able to go through some of it. E? Yeah, sounds good. Well, I appreciate you guys uh, bring the uh, questions up, right? Speaking of SEI, Solid Electrolyte Interface, uh, I believe the, the reason applied material joining Stanford Storage X, one, one of them is uh, we have a really powerful tool right here of cryogenic electron microscopy, which allow us to stabilize SEI in the liquid nitrogen temperature to study that carefully. Uh, we'll have a lot more understanding down the road. We have a few papers already out there on the SEI. We'll have a lot more just to let you know. So I want to ask the questions uh, to let you know, Jim, uh, Sujit, and Kang, uh, there are a lot of students and professors from academia, from national lab, listening to this uh, storage X symposium, probably a couple of thousands online. Uh, in the Zoom right here, you don't see that many because we have another channel to broadcast. So I think I bet everybody will be wondering about, you know, every year, Academia Lab published so many papers on batteries and uh, fundamental understanding of materials design. And there's a lot of creative idea. Uh, students and professor, professors will be wondering what academia has been doing, going to the industry, like what you have nowadays, what you demonstrate up to now. So what's the lessons learned from an initial concept, concept demonstration to today where you are? What's the challenges right there? Uh, can you share with the academia lab to really guide us, you know, how to do this process better? Maybe I'll start from uh, Sujit. I don't know whether Kang is still online. Looks like Kang's connection might not be stable again. He's in, in China at this moment. Uh, Sujit, can you take this question first? Yeah, I think I answered partly, but I, I will, let's say, defer this question to automakers, right? So when we go to automakers and when we say, hey, we have very high water per kilogram and very high water per liter, why are you not taking my technology and putting on the road? And that's where they come back. Number one, cost, 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 cost. So I would request, you know, universities and national labs also focus on cost that, hey, can you do something to lower the battery cost? Because you might have very, very attractive technology, uh, but if it is going to make the cost go up, automakers are not listening. 
So to me, like that's one big thing. Um, and then, then secondly, you know, like uh, I mentioned about meeting other specs. And, uh, I, and I, again, to that, I blame a lot to the financial venture capital community because they, have, they are using the metric of watt hour per kilogram and watt hour per liter to judge a technology or to fund a startup. That's a very wrong way because you have to meet all the specs. And, and that's where I would say, because see, for, let's, say, let's say a project at Stanford, the studying calendar life of silicon, it might not get funded because it is not sexy. So, so th these are things that worries me that this is what the financial community has done to this, that you know, just pushing a startup, which is, which is pushing the envelope of water per kilogram or water per liter, but not focusing on other specs that you know, automakers care about. So I would request that get automakers involved, ask them what they want and what will it take to take university research and commercialize it. So we are somewhere in between as a startup, we are very fast that we can take a technology from university, put it into a product and showcase to automakers, but it takes long years. I will stop right there. Okay, Jun, any thought to share? Yeah, and I would actually just kind of expand uh, on, on what um, Sujit mentioned there. Um, when you, we looked at the semiconductor industry in the earlier days, um, they did a pretty good job forming different consortiums. Uh, their Semitech was formed, several other industry uh, partnerships and alliances uh, to establish standards and uh, really uh, put, put roadmaps together for what each next generation technology is going to look like. Uh, and then the industry work like hell to deliver it. Um, we don't have anything like that right now in the battery world. Uh, and so everybody's off doing their own thing, uh, trying to solve some very, very difficult problems. Uh, and so, you know, I think this is really about how do we, you know, kind of get, you know, the industry somewhat focused on delivering uh, uh, some very key specific areas, uh, forming some partnerships, potentially consortiums and such, uh, and really going at it. Uh, to me, you know, we're very passionate about this idea of fast charge. I think it is really enabling. It will massively drive adoption of, of electric vehicles, which is what we're all trying to do here. Uh, but Apply can't do it alone. Amprius, Zen Labs can't do it alone. Stanford can't do it alone. Um, uh, as uh, Suji just mentioned, we have to do this in concert with uh, the auto OEMs, but they can't do it alone. So uh, how do we get, you know, a kind of a consortium together, a real initiative together, uh, so we can uh, uh, address these challenges? I think to me that otherwise it's either not going to happen or take a lot longer. So Jim, just to let you know, and Sujit and Kang, um, Stanford and Storage X, uh, uh, Will and I are planning some major activity on fast charging. It's a very exciting problem. Uh, we notice a lot of people uh, in the audience uh, from the uh, battery related industry. If you're interested in fast charging, get in touch with uh, Will and me. We, we are really planning something uh, big right now. So, so can I uh, come to you about the uh, question academia uh, <clears throat> from the academia lab back to where you are right now and Amprius, right? W what's the lessons learned and you can encourage academia to think about? Uh, I think the, uh, we probably uh, should cook the idea a little bit more at the uh, uh, at academic lab, for example, e, your lab is uh, much better equipped to do research than the industrial lab. Okay, once the idea uh, is not a fully has not a fully uh, uh, investigate, okay, the, this idea land to the industrial lab actually is a delayed process. Okay, the different lab has a different function. You know, your lab do pre preliminary research, exploratory research, much, much effective uh, than the startup lab. This is not my first startup. <laughs> Every startup I have, if, I, if someone hand me the idea, okay, uh, the, the academic lab can perform it better, you know, we actually de delay the process. 
Okay, so uh, yeah, I think that. Kang, I, I really agree with you. Uh, some of my students, they want to form startup. I, I often tell them, I said, uh, you have a great idea. You prove that you can publish your paper. To form a startup, have a commercial prototype, you need to solve five, 10, maybe even more problems to have that prototype. It's actually much harder. Uh, uh, that's exactly, I think, the, what you are saying is, uh, <clears throat> at university lab, we are very good at explore with huge resources. So. Um, with this question asked, I want to hand back to my uh, co-director, uh, Will. Uh, he is collecting also the questions from the, uh, the audience to, to ask you. Thank you, Yi. So there are many questions. Um, so let me try to maybe condense um, some of the questions. Um, so many of the questions has to do with the pre-lithiation. Uh, Jim, you highlighted that quite a bit, and, and Kang as well, and Sujit. Um, can you give a sense of what is the time scale of pre-lithiation? Yeah, is that, that for me? Sure, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, um, so um, the, uh, at least the, again, there are many different techniques that people are using. Um, Kong mentioned uh, a powder technique. Uh, there's a number of others. Uh, our technique, again, is uh, depositing a thin layer of lithium directly onto the anode. We like that approach because uh, we can control the amount of lithium very, very well, and we get a very high quality of lithium. We start with battery grade, and we're putting down uh, battery grade or potentially something even, even better. Um, the time scale is uh, when we're, we're running rolls and we're in meters per minute, uh, depending on how much, but it can be anywhere from, you know, uh, anywhere from five to uh, 30 or 40 meters per minute uh, to do that process. Um, uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned with the, uh, to kind of activate that lithium, uh, you would just do that as part of the standard uh, uh, battery manufacturing uh, process when you add the electrolyte. So no additional time for that. Great, Jim. Um, Khan, I'm curious, is the prelithiation time the same for different silicon morphologies? For the silicon, we used to have two uh, protocols for silicon graphite anode. Uh, Predecision. One of them actually invented by one of the East students. Okay, that's liquid phase predecision. Then our lab in Nanjing and they invent solid uh, uh, predecision. It's much, much faster. The equipment is very cheap, just a drum. <laughs> you put the particles in it, you just, you just rotate that drum for, for a while, then you produce it. Okay, so that, that, that part of, I think we saw solved the efficiency because the, after pre-seed, uh, we have the way to make a slurry, and we coat it, we dry every calendar. Okay, we have a very high efficiency. Our efficiency, I think, uh, I, just, I was in our Nanjing lab this morning. Our efficiency is 93.6%, okay, after pre-seed. Now, for silicon nanowire, uh, we used to use a contact, okay, pre-seed. That, that uh, certainly, uh, is not the most effective way to do it. Okay, now we are transitioning ourselves uh, to liquid phase uh, predecision. Thank you, Khan. Um, there was another related question on the role of inactive materials and prelithiation. Um, are there special considerations on the choice of binder when prelithiation is being considered and employed? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, maybe uh, actually, you know, Sujit, I'm going to defer this to you. Uh, you've done a lot of work on this, actually. Uh, I know you guys have uh, developed, uh, uh, so maybe you can talk first and then I'll, I'll add after you. Again, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like in our case, we use a different binder. So, you know, today's most standard anode binder is CMC and SBR uh, used for graphite. Then you also use PVDF uh, binder for uh, cathode. Uh, in our case, we are using a special binder, uh, which is stable at higher temperature. Uh, so it really helps the process. 
So we did not design it for pleutation. We designed it so that uh, it has high strength to keep silicon glued, but it turns out it's also helping in the pre-listen process that our binder is stable at high temperature. Yeah, so maybe I'll just comment on that. Um, from our standpoint, uh, the, the, uh, we can control the temperature uh, of our process uh, in order to keep it below uh, whatever the binder temperature is. So uh, we don't have to necessarily use a special binder. However, um, if you have a binder that can go to higher temperatures, that allows us to run at higher speeds. Uh, you get more throughput, get more output, get a lower cost. So from that standpoint, uh, we like um, binders that can handle higher temperatures. And that's why the, the binder that Sujit has there is, uh, works very effectively for our process. So let me ask uh, and maybe start zooming out a bit since we're running out of time. So there was a very interesting question on end of life considerations, um, namely material recycling, repurposing. Um, the listener noted that it wasn't mentioned, I think in Khan's and, and Suji's comprehensive slides of all the things you have to hit. So maybe I can ask some of you to take a moment and discuss your strategies and, and how important are you thinking about recycling and end of life consideration at this moment uh, and how does that play into your strategies? Yeah, that, that, that is uh, uh, industry by its own. Okay. You, you can see the, uh, there are many companies, uh, they are doing this for a living. Okay. In our factory, we have many of the scrap electrodes, actually people coming to buy it. Okay. People buy our waste water. Uh, we don't have really waste to, to, uh, to waste. Okay. All those waste material were purchased by uh, other companies. Yeah, uh, today, uh, including Tesla, is considering to have a recycle a batteries recycling factory business. Khan, you actually raise a very good point. Um, even just the waste management and the environmental impact during manufacturing is also something that's not uh, discussed enough. Um, maybe we can expand the question um, to include that aspect was well, not just the end of life of the battery, but uh, a scrap that's coming off the production line and uh, environmental remediation. For example, um, is silicon um, offering some superior benefits in terms of environmental impact? Um, are these considerations that you're looking into? Not in our factory. Uh, the silicon graphite, they, they pretty much the same. Of course, the graphite uh, is a dirtier, okay, uh, because of the color, yeah, but uh, they, they, uh, we handle them uh, in the same way. Yeah. So, so if I can add, uh, for us, um, you know, we're not working at the whole battery level, but uh, for this pre-lithiation process, I mentioned we use battery grade uh, lithium and, and lithium is a very expensive component. So we want to be extremely efficient in that use. Uh, uh, but any lithium that, um, uh, doesn't go directly onto the, uh, onto the anode, uh, we have to clean up. Uh, but the nice thing is uh, when we clean that up, we're, we can, we're effectively forming a lithium hydroxide, which is a precursor that goes into cathode manufacturing. Uh, so we're not there yet, um, but as we scale this uh, technology up to gigawatt scale, um, we certainly want to be able to take any of the unused lithium and be able to recycle that into uh, effectively what could be used as a precursor by our customers for cathode manufacturing. Thanks. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll have to be very brief. Um, I think this is a silicon anode panel, but I don't want to pass the buck, but you really have to focus on cathode. Uh, you know, the 70% cost of a lithium ion battery is materials and the costliest component is cathode. That's where you have uh, you know, all the precious metal, lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, and you want to make sure that those metals get recycled. So I, I really don't want to pass the buck, but I think that's the you know, biggest problem. I, I hope you will have a cathode panel, and I hope you'll ask them this question. What's your plan to recycle all these metals? You're reading our mind, Suji. Um, we're a bit past time, so maybe let me, um, before I hand things back to E, let me put in a big plug uh, for my colleague, Professor Ines Azevedo. 
So she, as part of our StorageX initiative, is investigating the CO2 footprint of battery manufacturing, really thinking about uh, comparing various um, manufacturing methods and understanding the CO2 impact. Uh, I think this is often not discussed, and um, this is something that I think we are very interested at the systems level. So thank you very much. E? Yeah, well, I, I would like to thank the three panelists, right, Kang, Suji, and Jim, for your insight. We could go on for another hour or two. There are many good questions in my mind and other you know, audience mind as well. So I guess we need, we'll need to stop and let uh, uh, Kang go to sleep and some of us to start a day. Uh, so let me end this, uh, uh, you know, this panel by having the last slide. Um, so I want to advertise our next event is on October 2nd, the same time. Storage X, X stands for, you know, everything connected with energy storage. So next one, we are going to expand our horizon a little bit, ha having X equals to fill. We have two world experts to join us, Pro Professor Sosina Haley from Northwestern University and Tom Haramiro. Is professor here at Stanford to talk about X equals to field. I look forward to seeing everybody at the next event. Uh, bye now.